Make that big boss less special It ain't no game, but they say I'm Welcome to the second level Um, <laughs> how's it going? Um, so miraculously, I am here and so happy to introduce um, a, a wonderful woman who I met at the very first Pixel Pop Festival. And I got to uh, sit down and chat with her briefly at the time, a little bit about our careers and about you know our perspectives of the industry. And I just remember being completely fascinated by her perspective and um, just the, the experience that she's had uh, in the professional fighting games community and um, in games in general. And so it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce, uh, once again, Jason Lee, who you all were able to see uh, give a, I, he, I'm, I hadn't been introducing him, but I'm also very fond of Jason. So Jason Lee is going to be moderating, but I'm very, very happy to introduce Leah Guilty Hayes. Hi, um, I'm so sorry for being a little bit uh, late. Uh, I'm definitely on a different time zone right now, so it's a bit of an adjustment for me. I apologize, but I am very happy to be here. Thank you so much. I appreciate Carol and Jason for having me. Uh, yeah, hi. Okay. What's up? So you're not entirely clear why you're here because you just came off the plane. So <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you're fine. Uh, so. I think not everybody here is necessarily familiar with what you've been up to entirely as a professional fighting game player. Mm. Uh, so if you could give me the very, very quick overview of that professional career that you've had and how that's kind of changed your relationship to games as a member of Team Graft, your professional esports team. So I am sponsored by a Japanese esports team known as Team Graft. Uh, I live in Tokyo for the most part. Uh, I'm based there like half the year and then the other half of the year I travel to events. I do a lot of tournaments. Um, for me, a lot of it is, I guess being a professional is being able to break the game down, but also create content and like be able to put yourself out there in a way where you're marketing both the game and you can also market yourself and use that potentially as a billboard to also have, you know, products, peripherals, things like, you know, Razer, for example. Um, you know, and also kind of presenting your social media in a way where it's, I guess uh, you make the lifestyle idea of being a pro gamer attractive, more attractive than it actually is, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, a lot of it started, I was in St. Louis, uh, I would play at tournaments and stuff like that. Born and, here, born here. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, so I am a St. Louis, well St. Charles, uh, I'm from St. Charles, and um, you know, so back in the day, back in the, uh, 90s, you know, we would have arcades and stuff like that. So there's kind of an arcade culture. So with fighting games, there's something very distinct and different from them to other esports. Maybe it's not as mainstream. It's, uh, you know, I think that a lot of times with most esports uh, that require like a PC, that kind of selects people who are higher on like the socioeconomic kind of spectrum, I guess, because they can afford these $3,000 machines, blah, 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 keep up with people, this and that. Whereas with arcades, Street Fighter, stuff like that, uh, they're kind of synonymous in the fact that if you can go, or back in the day, if you could go up to the arcade, your mom dropped you off with $20 at Northwest Plaza, you could potentially sit there on a quarter for hours. And if you were good, it didn't matter like what you look like, where you're from, you know, what other people thought of you, if you could win and you could get that W, you had that respect and everybody so, else just had to hold that. Yeah, so with games like that, mm. and especially because of fighting games being what they are as these one-on-one -on -one experiences, uh, how exactly have you tried to build yourself up in this particular like tournament community where you have those one-on-one -on -one games and you're trying to cultivate your own successes? Like, how are, how are you trying to do that going forward? And like, do you try and select games <laughs> specifically to show yourself off? So, okay, one thing about um, visibility, I would say, is that you kind of have to select the game. You know, obviously you have to select the game that you go for. Uh, if I really wanted to go, like, hard, I would be doing Fortnite or something. But obviously I can't do Fortnite, or well, it's not obvious, but I mean, you know, I can't do Fortnite because I don't have that, like, history with, like, um, first-person shooters, whereas with fighting games, I have kind of a pedigree of experience and, you know, a certain skill set that, I can kind of reuse with different iterations of like that genre. But with like a first person shooter, it's totally different. And then they've got these like Minecraft elements and stuff like that. So even though the fact that there's money there, 
I feel like it's maybe, there's also an issue of saturation, which, you know, I think that maybe my personal experience with being a professional player is, uh, I mean, you feel unique. Mm, yes. You, for, it, those of you who are also not aware, Emer Guilty is the only American ever sponsored to be by a Japanese company. Uh. You have a tremendous Japanese following. You are David Hasselhoff over there in terms of like your popularity. Like that's something you can um, do, right? Yeah. You're bringing over Japanese cosplayers, right? Uh. To Evo very soon, next week. I right? also manage Japanese talent in America. So I kind of am a broker from, well, I'm kind of selling Japan to the West and the West to Japan. So I kind of have like a interesting side hustle with that. Um, yeah, a sorry. Hustle, a uh. professional side hustle. Uh, and so you are this agent that kind of represents the FGC and you try and build it up in a mm. way that other people aren't necessarily able to or don't have the means to. So you have that relationship with the FGC that's very special. So how has that kind of shaped you, you know, as you think about yourself, like in that space? Because again, you are super unique in that way. I mean, I, okay. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, uh, so for me, I would say it was kind of easy to rise to some prominence because I have a very contentious relationship with my peers, and I'm not that shy about voicing my opinions about things. And also, I think that there's a certain degree where actions speak louder than words. And you know, if you want to sit at home and say all you want on the internet, you're just keeping like my name in people's mouths. And if you can't beat me, then what are you gonna do about it, punk? Like. <laughs> take a seat. I mean, so that's kind of like the attitude that served me well because at the same time I'm able to, I mean, kind of beat most players and kind of uh, stand up on like an international level. So <laughs> the fact that I'm a bit of a, how would you say, Troll lightning rod Troll. for criticism? I mean, oh, maybe okay. mine's more diplomatic. Yeah, because maybe. So with fighting games, it's structured a little bit, because it's not team-based, it's more like one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it's like MMA or pro wrestling to a certain extent, because you have personalities, and you're kind of encouraged to a certain extent to demonstrate your personality. So if you can, you know, emote and so present yourself, sorry? I do want to talk uh -huh. a little about that. So uh, people here who don't know this, you were on a reality TV show called The Challenger on TBS. Mm. Uh, which was a house of programmers like mm. yourself. Uh, and they had you do the whole show and dance, essentially, of, a, of a, any other reality show, basically. Like, a kind of the Bachelor situation, uh, where you all had to play these different games around games, right? Mm. And you all got those opportunities to show off, like, yourselves, right? So, in that experience, like, what were the... How did you try, like, not only talk about like some of those interesting reality show games that you were playing, but also what were the ones that like really showed off those personality and how you were trying to show your personality through that? So Maybe just one specific, like, specifically one. What was your like one that you remember the mm, most? Okay, so uh, considering we're just looking for one thing, can you repeat that again for me? Sure. So Sorry. all of those reality games that you played, uh. like the ones where you had to play in a mirror. <laughs> or uh, the ones where you all had to like go through the arcade mode. Which ones do you think were good for showing off that personality of the players? Personality of yeah, the exactly. players. Yeah. So for me in particular, um, there, the second challenge that we had was a round robin format. So in competitions, there's generally three formats. So single elimination, you lose once you're out. Double elimination, you lose once you go into a loser's bracket. You play through the loser's bracket. Winner of the loser's bracket fights the winner of the winner's bracket. Uh, and that's the grand finals and you go on. And then the last one is round robin, which is everybody plays everybody else and it's on like a grid. So like, you know, I would play you and then I would play you and I play you and I play you and I play you and then you'd play them and so on and so forth. And then everybody would have points. So if I beat you, I get one point. If um, you beat me, you get one point. And if I beat three people, you beat two people, then I have more points than you, therefore I win the round robin. Uh, so we had a round robin format, but everyone had the ability to change the other person's main character. So you could do that one time, and you had to choose the person that you felt was a threat to you. There was a particular player, uh, his name was JB, and his character was overtuned at the time, and overpowered, had, like a, a very strong counter to my character and 
the other strong player. And there's kind of a drop off in skill after like the top three. And then, you know, it just kind of... Let them know. Just tell them that there's, mm -hmm. there's an upper half of players in the house and then there was the bottom. Okay, okay. So, um, <laughs> there were the real players and then the people that were there. Uh, so, <laughs> the JB guy, his character was a direct counter to both of our characters and he also just washed everybody else for free. And what I did was I convinced everyone to go against JB, but for me, I also have a personally a bad matchup with the other top three player. So I made everybody, including <laughs> the other top three player, Jesse, go against JB, and I used mine to screw over J uh, Jesse. So because the JB won, uh, beat me, but I beat Jesse, both of us had five one points. So by the virtue of the system, I won, and I kind of screwed over my friend. But, um, and I remember this being shown off at the TV show. Is they really sold it as you being a schemer? Uh, well, they didn't actually show all of it because I went to every single person, and I'm like, "Yo, you gotta like get rid of this JV guy. Like, he's gonna like mess you up. Like, you gotta like do something about that." And like I told him like before any of this actually happened, like you know they got the confessional cam, and I'm like, "Okay, um, Jesse's my friend, but I'm gonna convince everybody." to go against JB and I'm gonna screw him over because he can beat me and that's my plan. And it worked. And It was great for the camera. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's yeah, it's very much survival. So yeah. for me, also, like I watched a lot of uh, you know, reality TV programming growing up, so I kind of knew about the meta of the game, whereas I feel like a lot of people were facing it too straight. So they're looking at it as maybe more so like, oh, I'm going to be really good at Street Fighter and I'm going to show my skills. And I'm like, ah, screw that. I don't want to do that. I want to get to that point. I don't want to get to the point where I have to play you. I want you to lose to someone that's better than me, worse than me. It doesn't matter. Just as long as you're out of the way and I don't have to worry about you. Um, you know, I think that... And this is the personality that you were selling. Like, this is the... The kind of uh, snaky person that you were you were selling, right? Only a little. Only a little. Only a little bit. You know, it's being pragmatic. Right. Because maybe if things are how to say calibrated against you in certain ways, you should optimize the tools that you have at your disposal to put yourself in that place where you can ascend to that position where you can write the rules and everybody else has to deal with them. Sure. And, you know, kind of going along with it, you know, the situation that you're in. You know, that event uh, had you and Sherry Jennings as the two women competitors. Mm. Uh, there's other invitational events within the FGC, the fighting game community, that are basically predominantly men, right? And the, the situations around them, and the tournament scene itself, right? It, it skews heavily towards men, right? Mm. And so that environment can be seen as potentially hostile. It's not one that's necessarily welcoming of gender diversity in those upper levels, right? As you just mentioned, uh, you know, there were the top three, and then there were the bottom three at, at, the, at the house, essentially. Uh, bottom four. Oh, wow, bottom four. OK. I didn't know you were in there, too. Uh, mm. <laughs> uh, you want to play? Yeah, uh, we can. So do you think that the? The, the games in some way are contributing to that, or is it just the community being a particular flashpoint of this type of issue on a broader social level? Like, Okay, so there are layers to this, I would say. First off, Good. Peel them back. I don't feel like, okay. Uh, no, I don't think it has anything to do with the game itself. I think it has a lot to do with culture. It's a lot to do with American culture, and then like you go over to Asia, and you see kind of like the way that they handle it, and the way that they approach it, and it's different. And I think that also the infrastructure of American cities does not necessarily contribute itself to be conducive to getting better at Street Fighter. Because... Specifically Street Fighter. Uh, okay. Whereas I think that with, uh, you know, for a city like Tokyo, you can have you know, it's a small, it's a really small city. Like, you can go from one end of Tokyo to the other end of Tokyo, 40 minutes for $3 on a train. And, like, that's pretty easy, that's pretty convenient. And if you have all the top players, something like, maybe the most concentration of top players in the world, and everybody is, at most, 40 minutes away from each other. You can meet very easily all the time and just play 12 hours a day. And that's the way that they approach it, that's the way they look at it, and that's what they do. Whereas in America, it's a lot more like you gotta, first off, 
if you play online, you have to deal with latency, you have to deal with lag. So if you're doing combos that have a 60th of a second precision on them, and you also have to deal with latency, like maybe this dude's from California, maybe this dude's from Brazil. I mean, you know, like, there's been a lot of problems with like online tournaments because it'll be that exact same problem. Like, you know, hey, I'm playing somewhere from a different country. Although this isn't about gender diversity, but I mean, I'm just kind of talking about how... Talking about pro skill level diversity. And yeah. Those are made. Like how you would advance. Like first you would start online and if you're female, you're definitely going to get a lot more attention. You're going to get a lot more controversy. People are going to try to get in your pants and like you're going to get a lot of attention again. I mean, so there's ways that you can... Positive and negative. Yes. There's ways you can optimize this, and there's ways that you can get consumed by this. And I feel like a lot of people tend to get consumed by it, and it's not their fault. It's a lot of the way that things are set up. It's like um, kind of your, how to say, like, uh, yeah, it's such a difficult topic. Um, there's a lot of pursuits that you can do that don't involve sitting down with a bunch of people who are socially awkward and playing a game for 12 hours straight and breaking down all the math of it and giving yourself arthritis and calluses and all that and you know I think that there's still a lot of women that appreciate the game which you know you think about the popularity of characters like Chun-Li, Morgan, Chun uh, Cami in terms of cosplay and stuff like that yeah, very so there's definitely a enjoyment of the characters but I think that as a competitor Part of it is people enjoy seeing the spectacle of someone suffering. So if I'm sitting there and I'm basically putting in that 12 hours of work a day to be able to perform in an exhibition kind of you know format and on screen and this and that and entertain people because to a certain degree that's what I am. I'm an entertainer. Uh, I have a talent in terms of game and all that, but like uh, you know the selling point is having someone who can win and also make it enjoyable. And I think that, you know, again, there's just, that's a masochistic kind of way to go forth. And because it's- of the forces kind of around you, or? No, I think even if there were none. But I think that for me, it works because- Oh, so you're saying like, when you put yourself under that pressure. You're yes. You're putting yourself under that spotlight. Before you take any of the like gender, stuff that might go along with that because that just further complicates it i'm saying like in base form okay it's already like you know you look at the pro players like I i'm not sure they're happy <laughs> honestly um you know it's not an easy life and there's a lot more secure ways so, to go about things okay so if they aren't happy right uh -huh. like so you're not happy right let's say you aren't let's say you aren't right you have this game that you presumably love right? uh, -huh. uh and so these issues that you see as being something that like are just culturally driven, right? Uh. Uh, do you, and, and as the games pertain to that culture, do you foresee a way of taking the games and the games, like specifically the games like Street Fighter, and allowing those games to help you build a better culture through that? Does that mm. make sense? To a certain extent, but I think that it's a little difficult to put it in something that's practical and usable. Um, you hypothesize something like that as somebody with okay, so who deals with those pressures. I th like to see. Okay, okay. Repeat that question because I think I might have like an answer, but it's kind of a big answer. All right, great. Uh, so I'd like to ask you the ways, insofar as games themselves contribute to that culture, right? That cultural mm. pressure. What type of changes could you see in the games? practical changes in those games that could help you deal with those pressures and alleviate some of those pressures. Okay, you know, so make happier pro players. I'm going to create some context for this and I think that part of it is with the pro player it's okay to have a division between a pro player and a casual player because a casual player plays for fun, the pro player does not play for fun. The pro player plays with kind of a relationship with the game and the designers of the game to demonstrate what you're able to do in the game. So it's a job. It's not about your fun. It's not about how much you like sure. it. If you like work at whatever you do, like even if you enjoy your job to a certain extent, I enjoy the travel. I enjoy going around doing all these things. But the nitty gritty of it is I'm trying to break down the game in a way where I can show people what you can do with the game so they can have more fun with it. So I'm sharing my jo like maybe I want to say enjoyment is not the right word but I think that also people enjoy different things. Like for me, well, 
So to bring you back okay. into what you were just saying Sorry. about like show, no, you're fine. To to bring you back into that idea of showing off to other things, are there obstacles currently in the games to do that? Like, what are what's getting in the way of that? If that's what you really want to do, like, are the you know, I, Street Fighter I think that yeah, it's just the, its own road. I think it's all the groundwork because Street Fighter is such a legacy. Can you go into that what that groundwork is a little. Elaborate? Uh, quick. Just. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean. So yeah, Street Fighter is 30 years old, so there's people who are 40 year olds old now who have 10 year olds who are picking the first Street Fighter character. And they can have the experience of, yo, I threw like some fireballs, you know, in uh, Northwest Plaza 30 years ago, something like that. And, you know, their kids are getting older. And the other thing about kids is kids don't care about baseball, football, hockey, this kind of stuff. I mean, maybe some of them do, but I would say that for like, by and large, the thing is video games replace sports for a younger generation. and. You know, the more that the generations kind of cycle out, you know, people will keep on having kids who have never known a life where there hasn't been a Pokemon or anything like that. You know, like, <laughs> maybe like, you know, those kids now that are, what, like 20 years removed from the first time there was a Pikachu? Like, yeah. you know, there's that legacy and there's also the global aspect of Street Fighter. You go to Kuwait, you, you know, people know Ryu and Ken and stuff like that. You go to Brazil, China, like all these things. like. It's universal to a certain extent. Okay. Um, whereas, again, we like. We have that groundwork. Yeah, and I want to make this point too. I apologize. I know I'm going a little over time, but this is something I want to we say. Have, we have lunch, we have open time. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay, so like, Street Fighter is different and unique in the fact that it is, well, not just Street Fighter, Street Fighter, Tekken, all these like fighting games. Because anyone can play them. So it's a lot more diverse in some ways, and it's a lot less diverse in other ways. Because like, <laughs> so let's hear those diversities. Okay, so in terms of competitive Street Fighters, uh, Street Fighter players, more often than not, I find myself to be the only Caucasian person in the room. Also, I tend to find myself the only like, the, like a bunch of dude bros at the same time. So, like, we get big points on cultural diversity and very low points on gender diversity. And I think they kind of play into each other to a certain extent. Also, it tends to be very like uh, LGBT friendly, which again, you know, kind of like if you're good, if you can win, if you can handle it, then it doesn't matter like where you're from, who you're into or whatever. It's just, if you can win and you can hold that like spot, then you hold that spot. That's the end of it. That's, that's what it is. People have to respect you. And if they want to disrespect you, they can keep on losing. That's all it is. And like, in Japan, it's interesting because they have these initiatives for female players. Whereas, again, obviously, Japan is an ethnically homogenous like country, so they totally fail on the whole diversity thing. But, like, um, in no, I mean, I'm just saying, like, uh, some interesting stuff happens. Like, you know, if you have someone in Japan who's obviously like not Japanese, they get a lot of bad treatment. Like. You know Sherry? From the show. Yeah, yeah, they treated her really bad. Okay. Like no one would talk to her or anything like that. So it's kind of weird over there. But like in terms of like their initiatives to include women, they do a lot. They have like bars, they've got like nights where like you just show up, someone will teach you, and like as a result, there's a lot of strong Japan or Yeah, this is Japan. Okay. Um so they have a lot of really strong female players over there. And it's because people make the initiative to kind of create good players. Like Choco Blanca, she's like, um, she's married to Momochi. Momochi, and they like kind of run their own thing. In Japan, there's like a, you know politics behind it, and they're kind of pariahs, but they do their own thing, uh, Shinobism, which is they just take these young kids, and they're like, hey, we're gonna teach you how to play Street Fighter. Here's all this information, and like. A lot of them are pretty strong and like it works and that's the thing about Street Fighter that is different again is you have to have that in-person contact. I was kind of alluding to it earlier where like with Tokyo like it's very easy to have everyone gather up frequently whereas in America it's like you know you've got New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Vegas, Texas has three cities. You know, so on that point, do you imagine we could have a type of fighting game that, instead of emphasizing that physical closeness, like can be? I think that's stupid. Difference? What? 
emphasize like you know oh, oh let's, let's make should... this more impersonal no that's right. that sucks so, okay so you, you I think that people a, should encourage yeah. events people should make it so you come out and like I'm seeing you I'm talking to you I'm making an actual right. friend with you we can go like get dinner afterwards or something like that that's important that's something that's missing from games it goes more and more into this like kind of uh, impersonal hey guys let's play some games all right what's your like Xbox Live name no I mean show up at my house Right. Like, I will buy you a pizza. I don't care. Like, yeah. yeah, totally. Um, you know, and you know me. I've bribed people with food to play games with Arguably. me. Like, for years. Because, like, I, I don't care, Talk like, about. what their, you know, like, problems yeah, of, are. We're going to play some games. We're going to get good at this. Um, and I think that you really need someone to drive that. And I know that, like, one of the things that you guys had, like, mentioned to me, like, before I got into this was about the relationship with uh, developers, designers, and actual players. Right. Which I think is something we didn't really talk that much about. Mm -hmm. But, again, like, I have a lot of opinions about it. Um. <laughs> well, okay, so, so if you want to have games that have that, that heavy, in, and not necessarily on the physical locality of being like, oh, we're in LA, or oh, you're in Houston, or oh, you're in Chicago, mm. uh, and being able to play next to that. Instead, you want to have games that are focused on being really personal, right? And yes. Being, you because know, in that way, so, right? And again, like this reaches to like my international experiences, right? So like I can meet someone I don't speak a language with. I can sit down, I can play Street Fighter, I can push a button, you understand what it is, I understand what it is. It doesn't matter if we speak the same language, it doesn't matter where you're from, we're still speaking the language of Street Fighter. Right, and we're having that communication. That yeah, and like you meet people, you get yourself out of your house, you put yourself in new situations, new environments, new cities, new countries sometimes, and you have new experiences, and I think that's something about gaming that is maybe not explored as much as it should be. Yeah, I've called this intimate games maybe. You weren't here for that, but. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but the idea that you could design specifically for that, that moment of communication, right? You, you see that as something that fighting games are very good at. You know what I think is fantastic? Final Fantasy XIV has a language <laughs> translator in it. Okay. So it doesn't matter if you're Japanese, you're German, you're whatever. Like, if we play on the same server, we can use this little feature mm -hmm. and we can communicate. So we're bringing each other together. Yeah. And I think that's the thing about gaming is it's a medium you can communicate with other people and you know there's rules to the game and if we all agree to the rules okay so the idea we can have a conversation you're so if you were going to like hypo, again try and hypothesize something practical out of it right mm. the the street the street fighter 6 the hypothetical street fighter 6 vampire that, 4 uh, it's okay fine vampire savior 4 dark stalkers uh, <laughs> Darkstalkers 4, if you, the next big one, basically. Mm. How would you hope that it emphasizes what you're talking about right now, this communication aspect? Like, what is missing now that you want to see? You know, okay, so I think that Street Fighter does the eSports excellently. I think what Street Fighter does poorly is maybe, like, budgeting with, like, uh, bureaucracy and kind of the East-West split. So this is maybe not like giving you the answer that you're looking for because a lot of it is like I am kind of familiar with the company to a certain extent, and you know there's like uh, Japanese developers who are very set in their old ways. Oh, you're talking about East West America Japan, yes. not East West Coast. No, 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 okay. no. <laughs> I'm talking about like you know <sighs> Japan is interesting to work with. Um, like okay, so my well, character. <laughs> is currently pretty strong. And the reason why this happened was because I made a video with a Japanese player through my team and all that. And it was well enough where the dev team knew about it. And they came and they asked me what I thought about Monat and what Monat needed to get better. The character. Yeah. Yes. And I told them. And then they listened to me. Well, so now she's in the top same, three. In the same way, we're all listening to you now. So like in the broad spectrum of like the potential Dr. Suckers 4, it might not come from Capcom, right? Mm. It might come from somebody in this room, right? Or somebody in this building. Mm. Uh, you know, if you had something to say to them about what you want to see, right? What do I want to see? Right? I mean, you know, I That's think that a lot of it is 
to a certain extent, more of the same, like with what Capcom is doing. But I think that a lot of it, honestly, is outside of the realm of the designers. I think that it's players. It's people taking that grassroots. So maybe, you know, it's not in the game itself. It's like kind of the relationship that you have and how you guys promote your players, like who, you know, who you want to showcase the game. Because as I said, like, you know, if I have a relationship with someone like Capcom, my design, uh, my job is to show people how to play this game, how to enjoy this game, because this game is too hard for people who aren't, fuck, sorry, who aren't masochists. This is a kid for Sorry, um, I, I apologize, but, uh, you know, like, where was I? I got caught I'm up. I'm talking about emphasizing players. But yes. it sounds like we So, like, yeah. okay, so a lot of this is outside the game. Because we briefly talked about this, and, like, you were mentioning, like, you know, stuff, like, inside the game to kind of, you know, promote and everything. And I'll be honest with you. If I have a choice between using an in-game UI or YouTube, I don't care about the UI. I'm going to watch YouTube. Because this stuff's easy. I can do it on my phone. Like, even, like, Twitch. You think, like, the Twitch app on my phone. It's a nightmare. I'm not doing that. Like, it's... So it sounds like integration's nice. Yeah. If it's seamless. But if there's even a slight reason for me to just alt tab YouTube, I'm gonna do that. Like and I think that maybe that's not something that's worth really like worrying about too much. Is that kind of what you're asking? I'm sorry. It is kind of what I'm asking. But it like I, I, like I didn't to even try and cut you off really. Tangent. No, it's fine. Uh, the the thing that it sounds like you're talking about is really having, if you want to build up those environments, build those communities, it has to come from like the creator, excuse me, the creators of the game to kind of promote those players that they care about, right? So for Capcom to find you and mm. then to promote you, for Grass to come out and find you and promote you. And A lot of this you, was right? me taking initiative. Right. So I'm looking at it and I'm being like, okay, there are certain voids, like there's holes. There's things that I can do to fill up the gaps and I mean, you certainly feel a gap in Team Graft, right? Of course. <laughs> but, you know, it's looking for opportunities and niches and not being afraid of it. Although I think that's one thing about players in general is that players tend to be timid. They're not always the most charismatic. They're not always outgoing. So you kind of have to, like, drag them out of their comfort zone. And I think that also a lot of them... Mm, don't really think about it in maybe the right industry mindset, I would say, because there's kind of a tendency to be like, hey guys, I'm going to play on Xbox Live and I'm going to get a lot of points and then I'm going to get sponsored and everyone's going to love me and I'm going to win all the tournaments. Or the type of player who's like just very loud online. Uh, yeah, but I think that's kind of the same. Okay. You know, like you're talking. You're not letting your actions speak for yourself. I think a lot of people like to do that. Like, I tend to not tell people like what I do in terms of like professional gaming because unless I want to sit there and be like, yeah, you know, one time I went, and I won a GameStop tournament for five thousand dollars in Guitar Hero like six years ago. There's no like re you know record of it, but I, I, I definitely. And it's like, yeah, okay, sh sure, buddy. Like, that's. that's do you kinda... want more record keeping actually in the games? Oh, record keeping's nice. Yeah, I like, like that. Like, you suck. I know you suck. Ouch. That's not. That's not true like five years ago. That I, was I saw your stuff. I definitely no? beat you multiple times, but anyway. Uh, yeah, and then you left. You yeah. couldn't handle it. You abandoned me. You left me with the vultures. And then what did I do? I went and I conquered everybody. Yeah, now everybody. you made it. Yeah. Started from the bottom. Where are you? Where were you? I'm talking to you, aren't I? Mm. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, Sorry. So there, there definitely are, it does seem like there are some things like, uh, that we could do, like mm. being better about player outreach, being better about tracking these events that are happening. I think I vaguely remember Dead or Alive from Tecmo did that a little. Or at least you know, they were advertising. Street Fighter's tracking sucks. It does suck. <laughs> uh, not to disparage many games, but I, I, I there's Actually, no way to like, know, do I, the tournaments within the game or anything like that. Like, I, community engagement for the game seems to be a big sticking point for you. Street Fighter is actually kind of an interesting case for a lot of reasons because of how the development cycle went for five. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm talking, uh, talking about? They rushed it out for eSports, but then they didn't have all the, like, content. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, it wasn't, like, story mode or arcade mode or whatever. And, like, for most people, like, who cares? But that's not the point of it. The point of it is to get on the big screen, make it, like, an entertainer, spectator kind of thing. Okay. Um, 
and sorry, I get off time. Does designing lot. for spectators matter? Yes, yeah. that matters. That matters a lot yeah. because again, like you got the professional player, and then like to make the professional player suffer, you have to make it entertaining for everybody else. Okay. Like, you want to f see the drama of what they're going through. You want to see the pain. You want to see somebody get mad. You see someone throw a stick. You want to see someone put their fist up, all happy, pop off, do a happy dance, take their shirt off, whatever they do. Do you recall the PlayStation uh, Four? There was some game for PlayStation Four where it involved a camera, and it, like it would show. Was it Until Dawn where it would like record your jump scares on the camera? Would you want something like that for Street Fighter, like record a win? Like I don't play? like replay. I mean, not like uh, replay. Not like, you could obviously choose to share that if you wanted to or not. But like a pop off. I think like, in the you... game it would be superfluous. But I think that voice chat is something that can be very. That's a good for... sword, right? Like. Yeah, but I think that for community building, it's better to have the ability to make a community within the game. Mm -hmm. So I think voice chat is maybe the only thing that I would say is really important, because you know, like if I'm playing you and I'm just destroying you. And I can't tell you, hey man, like you can just like block that, or like you can push this button here. Like, it makes it so much more difficult for all of us because I do think that it is kind of clumsy to have to go through Facebook. But then again, like, you know, I think you're playing on like PlayStation primarily because that's a tournament standard. Like, you can't sit there and also like, you know, cruise social media. Yeah, I mean you can, but it's difficult. Right. So, since we are over sorry, I, well, no, you're fine. I think, you know. Imagining the community in five years and the types of games they'll be playing. Mm. Uh, you know, talking about some of the changes that we've been hypothesizing. You know, which are the things that you're hoping for? I guess in the community specifically, because that is more your purview. Like, what type of changes are you hoping that will be there, or even yourself? Like, you you hopefully plan on being around in still five years, right? Of course. Right. In some so what, facet. What's that picture look like? If you could so I'm not sure that I'll be a competitor in five years because I'm getting kind of old. But I think that, you know. Um, I mean, look at the skin. Mm. But the reactions, it's not there. Okay. It's not like it was 10 years ago. But anyway, that's not the point. Um, so I think that I would like to see maybe more mainstream acceptance. I think that's a big thing. You know, and there's definitely been steps, you know, TBS, ESPN, and all this and that. Uh, but I think that as kind of the younger generation gets older, it'll be more and more accepted and more and more of what people want. And, you know, like, I think that it's headed in a very good direction, provided it doesn't burst. And I think that, you know, not to get into like. Inside baseball? No, but I mean, like, I'm just saying, like, maybe with some of the current political things going on globally, there may be a sudden shift from leisure to other things. So I think, aside from that happening, uh, esports is kind of it's going in a direction, it's on a rise. And, um, you know, provided that everything just kind of goes hunky dory, I think it's in a good place and things aren't going to bu uh, burst in a bubble too much because kids like it. And I think that having more women involved, having more, I would say, global integration, and also kind of creating more catering to casual fans, spectators, and making events more accessible for people to come, and also having maybe more initiatives to cultivate skills in other people. I think those are the things that will be most beneficial moving into the for, uh, future. OK. Hmm. All right, well, thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Unless anybody else has a question, but. He's got a question, I guess. Ain't no game, but they say I'm